Do you want to live in the most expensive house that's on the market right now, just down the street from Drake, Canada's most famous rapper? Today I'll show you what it'll actually take for us to make this a reality. But before I do, let me tell you a story about the first and only time I drove by Drake's house that could have ended really bad for me. So I have this high school friend from Vancouver. He was in town and we're driving back one evening from Niagara Falls. And uh, he was like, yo, let's go check out Drake's house, which was about like a two hour drive from where we were. So we pull up to his house and it was at night, so I couldn't really see anything. But there was security outside because Drake was probably home or maybe it's probably because everybody in the entire world knows where he lives. And you can literally just Google his address online. So we pull up to the front of his house, creeping, and my buddy rolls down his window and sticks out his head and shouts, F you, Drake. I drive off shaking my head and giggling like a little schoolboy because I couldn't believe this guy's still barking out the window like he used to back in the days. Nothing's changed. And then a few minutes later, it hits me. We were just creeping up on Drake's crib at night, driving back from Silverdale, packing a whole lot of heat. For those of you who know what's up, you know what I'm saying. Okay now, let's get back to daydreaming about buying the most expensive house in Toronto, which is currently on the market for $28 million. Last time we analyzed the cheapest house in Toronto, so if you wanna compare the two, you can catch that video up here. To give you an idea of how rare a sale like this is, and to show you that our luxury market is nothing close to the world-class cities like London, Hong Kong, or New York, throughout the entire MLS recorded history, there have only been four houses that have sold for more than $20 million in the city of Toronto, and all were in the most exclusive neighborhood in Toronto, the Bridal Path. Prominent Toronto business people, celebrities, doctors, and engineers have lived and do live in this area. Conrad Black, Robert Herjavac from Dragon's Den, and even the late Prince used to own in this neighborhood. So if you have FU money, this seems like the place to be in Toronto. For this analysis, I'll have to assume a few things because I personally have never had the opportunity to sell a $20 million home before. So the first assumption we'll make is that we can get this house for $25 million, as usually properties in this price point are negotiable. Next, we'll assume we pay an initial deposit of 10%, which is about $2.5 million. We'll also assume that the lawyer fees are gonna be just $2,000. I'm not sure if the lawyers will charge more at this price point, but we'll just assume that they won't. We'll also assume that the title insurance is just over $24,000, which I got from this title insurance website, but it does say that the limit is $5 million, so anything above this number should be disregarded. Uh, but I don't have any other references, so we'll just use this number. We'll also assume a rent of $0 because we're gonna be living in the place. For some context, the most expensive rent ever recorded on the MLS in this area was $66,000 per month. Okay, here's a big assumption. We'll assume that the bank will allow you to pay 20% down payment. Most likely, if you're playing in these numbers, you'll have to put a lot more down. But just to keep everything consistent with our previous example, let's just assume that a 20% down payment is okay in this case. For the mortgage, we'll assume a 5% interest rate with a 30-year amortization and a five-year fixed term. We'll also assume no renovations and just leave out all the utility costs for now, as we've done in the previous videos. I'm sure that the cost to run this place will probably be in the tens of thousands of dollars, but let's just leave this out for now, just to keep everything consistent with my previous videos. We'll assume home insurance will be around $32,000 per year, and I took the property tax from the listing, which we rounded to $73,000. Finally, We'll assume that the selling price will be the same as the purchase price in year one, and the real estate commissions will be 5% when you sell, along with a $2,000 lawyer fee. Now, let's take a look at the numbers we need to achieve to make this dream house become a reality. Okay, party pooper, look at this. The land transfer tax alone will be over $2,053,000 in cash. You can see that the new municipal property tax is in play here, which was implemented in 2024, coming in at over $1.44 million. 
Before 2024, it would have been exactly the same as a provincial land transfer tax of $611,475. But now we're paying $830,000 more. This is our government getting a piece of this action and you thought real estate agents were overpaid. On top of that, your legal and your insurance costs will come in at just over $58,000. So with these additional costs that makes your actual total purchase price $27,111,303.66. On closing, we'll have to come up with another $4,611,000 and some change because we already put a 10% deposit of $2.5 million. So our total cash invested will be $7,111,332.66. Now, if we look at the cash flow, we'll need to pay $116,000 every single month without any of the utility cost or maintenance and repairs taken into consideration, or just under $1.4 million per year. Using the mortgage qualification estimate where three times your housing costs should be your after-tax income, you will need to make around $4.2 million in after-tax income per year or $9 million a year before taxable income to afford this place. The ROI is not relevant because we're assuming you're buying it as an owner-occupier. One interesting thing to note is the break-even point. You'll have to sell for $28,645,123 or 5.66% higher than what you bought it for because of the real estate and lawyer fees. If you subtract this from your actual purchase price of $25 million, that's just over $3.645 million of money that just disappears into the taxes and fees on day one. Now, let me organize this for you in the simplest of terms. Listen up, especially you high achieving gold diggers out there, because I'm about to set the minimum standards on what it's going to take for you to make your dream house come true. To qualify to buy this place, you will need to have $7,111,332.66 in cash to put down. Plus, you'll need to have a before-tax income of over $9 million per year, as it'll cost you over $1.4 million a year just to keep the house. Just keep in mind that in reality, someone who could afford to buy this house probably won't be buying under their personal name and going through a corporation. So some of the requirements will change, but this gives you some benchmarks on what to strive for if buying a house like this is important to you. I don't know about you, but personally, even if I had all the money in the world, I don't think I'll ever buy a house like this. If you think I'm crazy and I'm full of crap, listen up because you may be the one confused and may have been infected with a mind virus that society and you have created for yourself. You may have been brainwashed into a complete false reality of the actual world around you. Ask yourself the following questions to test if this applies to you and answer truthfully in your heart. Do I daydream about having more money and how it'll change my life? How more money will bring me more status, respect and recognition from people around me? and how more money and the things I can buy with it will make me more sexually attractive? Ask yourself, how do I feel when I see others with better things than me? Do I feel envy or jealousy? Does it irritate me when people I know have nicer things than me and they flaunt it? Do I hate rich people? Do I feel that life has been unfair to me. Well, how'd you do? Let me give you my two cents for what it's worth because my personal answer to every single question before I woke up and then shackled my mind from these thoughts was yes to all. You see, I truly know how it feels like being a crazy poor Asian because for most of my life I was. Just to be clear, I wasn't poor to the point where I was living on the streets and didn't have enough to eat, but by modern standards, I was poor, especially in my mind. Even today, many times I catch myself in this broke mindset because I feel poor when I get tight on cash flow, even though I'm a multimillionaire. 
I don't know if any of you experienced the same thing or can relate, but I want to take you back to the source of where it all began. I first got infected with this poor mind virus when I was in grade seven. Before that, I never really thought about money or how I compared with others. And I lived a pretty happy life spending most of my time in the woods on my own, exploring nature, hunting for critters like frogs, snakes, and pretty much anything that moved. I grew up in a townhouse complex called the Orchards in Surrey, BC. And back in those days, there were literally forests all around me, and it was like my own little paradise. I attended public school till grade six, but in grade seven, my mom put me into a private school. This was the first time I realized how poor I was in comparison to everyone else, because there were a lot of rich kids in the school. They all had brand name clothes while I only had one pair of buffalo jeans, which I wore pretty much every single day because I was so embarrassed to wear anything else that wasn't brand named. Some of the kids would literally make fun of your clothes if they were different. Uh, I remember one time I wore these jeans that my mom gave me that had these like dangly little zippers in the back pocket. And the cool kids I was hanging out with snickered and made fun of me behind my back. I was so embarrassed. I never wore those jeans ever again. Uh, another time, uh, there was this rich kid that invited us over to his mansion for his birthday party. Ironically, his dad was a real estate agent. I felt so out of place, and one of my, one of my classmates said, the dog lives a better life than us, which I thought was true because in comparison, I lived in a tiny rented two-bedroom townhouse with my family of five. My economical Asian parents were able to squeeze a bunk bed and a single bed into one tiny room so that my brothers and I each had our own beds. So we pretty much lived on top of each other. That year also was the year I started getting into secular music, pop culture, and what society deemed as cool. I started to fantasize about living someone else's life, and my mind was infiltrated with these thoughts as I started making decisions based on how others perceived me. I was envious of my rich friends and started blaming my dad for giving me this poor and miserable existence where I couldn't even afford to buy some brand name clothes. Then in grade eight, we moved to into another townhouse complex in Delta, a suburb next to Surrey, as my parents thought it was uh, time for me to have my own room. My brothers still had to share. I went to Siakwam, an affluent upper middle class high school. Again, it seemed like all the other kids were richer than me. To make things worse, I didn't really know anyone there, so I didn't have many friends. I recall early in the school year, I was trying to hang out with these guys during lunch break. And there was this one well-off Indian kid who would buy everyone in the school, uh, well, everyone in the group, uh, snacks from the school store, but intentionally left me out, making it so obvious I wasn't a part of their crew. Uh, then one day they tried to lose me by speed walking away from me. They would walk into the locker room and into the bathroom and just go around in circles while I followed them around like a tag along idiot uh, when it was so obvious that they were just trying to ditch me. I got the point uh, that I wasn't welcome. So basically I became a loner. I really didn't look forward to recess or lunch because I would have to hang out on my own and hide in the library or some remote part of the school to just kill time. Back then we didn't have any internet, so there was literally nothing to do if you were a loner like me. Um, these experiences reinforced the mindset that this was all happening because I was poor. So I would fantasize about wealth and popularity, which became like an obsession. The majority of the kids in the school were white and well off, so I felt really out of place. Don't get me wrong here, I'm not trying to play the race or poverty card here, but it's important to be honest about my mindset at the time because my thoughts were completely corrupted and blaming others was the name of the game. Although I have experienced racism, in reality, race had nothing to do with what I was going through. In fact, my mind became so convoluted that I became the racist with a victim mentality. I developed this hatred towards white or rich people. I also started getting into hardcore gangster rap. I don't know how much of a role this played in my corruption, but at the time, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So I would have the music on repeat till I memorized entire songs. I was able to relate to it as it would talk about getting money, hating on white people, 
and authority. So it was exactly what I craved for. So this music fed the darkness in me. I stopped attending church because I didn't want to live according to biblical rules anymore because I thought it wasn't cool. I uh, questioned God and why he let me live this poor, miserable existence. My parents were way too busy trying to make a living running their tiny sandwich store, which was a long commute to Vancouver. They left before I woke up every morning and came back in the evening, so they weren't really able to pay attention to what I was going through in my life. Fortunately, I started Korean martial arts called Hapkido, so I did have a community of friends around me outside of school where I did fit in, so I didn't go completely insane. Also, martial arts did instill some discipline and help me build some confidence in me. Although in some aspects, it made things worse because now I thought I could fight and beat people up, making me cool. This one time I uh, picked a fight with this black kid named Mike because I wanted to um, impress some Vancouver boys who I barely even knew that didn't like him because uh, one of them was jealous of him being close friends with his girlfriend. So back in those days, I thought if you were from Vancouver, you were cool, especially if you were a gangsta. So I made an excuse to pick a fight over $10 that he lost to me in a game of pool. And these Vancouver gangsta boys came to back me up. Mike was actually a really cool, well-liked kid. He looked like one of those guys from Criss Cross and had the same dreads and stuff. He was always friendly to me, but I betrayed him because my mind was so corrupted with hate and anger and trying to make myself fit in and look cool in front of others. So the day of the fight, he actually gave me back the $10 he owed me, but I was so set on fighting him that I like smacked it out of his hands trying to provoke him. I also remember trying to circle kick him in the head. Luckily I missed, but he wouldn't fight back. And then the Vancouver boys were like cheering me on. So then I actually smoked him in the head with an umbrella, but he still didn't do anything. He just glared at me with tears swelling up in his eyes. So I backed off, but I still remember that look till this day. My transformation was complete. The oppressed had now become the oppressor. I had now become the bully. In grade 10, my parents decided that we were going to move to Vancouver as they had enough of the long commute. My parents rented this uh, tiny bungalow that was literally rotting from the inside out and that was infested with wood lice. There were so many bugs that there was no point in cleaning them up because they were just literally scattered dead all over the floor, especially in the basement kitchen area of the house, which we pretty much used as storage. We dare not enter that area without wearing slippers as they would just crunch and stick to the bottom of your feet. Now that I reflect back uh, in those days, my mom probably got sick because of this house and had to have, had to have a part of her lung removed because she developed this lung infection and had this chronic cough. I also remember developing these crazy, crazy migraines that lasted for like three weeks. I also remember the pitiful look that the lady who eventually bought the house gave me when she came for showings. I guess she felt uh, sorry for us. I went to high school at uh, Eric Camber, which was in the west side of Vancouver in the Shaughnessy catchment area, probably one of the richest neighborhoods in Vancouver. It's like, the Van it's like the bridal paths of Vancouver. I ironically lived on Ontario Street, which is the border of the east and west side of Vancouver. So I barely made it into this school catchment. Had I lived across the street, I would have gone to an east end school called uh, John Oliver. And fate had it that I was, again, one of the poorest kids in the school. But this time it was different. My school was like 90% Asian, so I felt more comfortable there and I was getting a fresh new start. So I quickly made friends and it was a completely different experience from my time in Delta. I was still deeply insecure and cared about what other people thought about me. So I put on this like bad boy persona so that no one would try to mess with me. Um, by then I was like a second degree black belt as well. So I thought I knew how to fight. So that gave me some confidence. I bullied other students that dared to cross me and started hanging out with like a crew of juvenile delinquents. Um, I discovered weed during this time, which led to other hard drugs, but fortunately 
I only experimented a few times and never progressed into anything harder. You know, things seemed fine on the outside now, as I had a group of friends, uh, popular friends, but inside, nothing really changed. I was a deeply insecure monster, and to make up for this, I was very angry, aggressive, violent, arrogant, and proud. I was uh, defiant of authority and fearless as I didn't think about the consequences of what I did as long as I was, as long as I was serving myself while looking cool in front of my peers. I was a complete fake. Uh, and the school environment didn't really help much either because as some of my acquaintances were literally crazy rich Asians, uh, the kids of the richest Asian tycoons. I remember one guy bragging about how he had like 20 pairs of Versace shoes. 16 year olds would drive up in like $100,000 cars all souped up with body kits and rims. It was like a supercar show every lunchtime as the rich kids would pull up in their fancy sports cars and park them right in front of the school where all the smokers and uh, cool kids hang out. I always liked hanging out with the rich kids because I thought that made me cool. But inside I was really jealous and envious of their wealth. So I hated my life, actually. I remember a, a time a group of us went to a fancy, fancy uh, Chinese restaurant to eat. And I remember sitting there worrying about how I was gonna pay for the bill uh, or my part of the bill because I literally had five dollars in my pocket and they were ordering all this expensive food. You know, when the bill came, I asked one of my friends uh, who was generous enough, generous enough to, to pay for me, but I was deeply ashamed. I never had an allowance, so I was always pretty much broke, except when I would uh, pull a side hustle to make a few extra bucks. So by this time, uh, darkness had completely engulfed me and sucked me into the abyss. I was blind and uh, didn't care about anyone but myself. I was obsessed with I was obsessed with money, impressing others, partying, playing video games, and doing anything that made me feel good. Getting drunk and high pretty much every day. My high school years went by in a blur with some of the most craziest experiences and with some of the biggest regrets in my life. Although I was stuck in the abyss, there were some glimmers of light. So I somehow managed to stay out of jail, survive, and graduate on time because there were actually a few people who still believed in me. One was my English teacher, Margaret Kalaski. Before I met Ms. Kalaski, I failed grade 10 English, which I 100% deserved. Uh, while my teacher was away getting knee surgery, I made this substitute teacher's life a living hell to the point that she broke down and cried in front of the whole class. I'm pretty sure that I traumatized her, which I feel absolutely terrible about now that I'm looking back on it because she was actually a really nice person. Now that I think about it, she wasn't the only teacher I drove to tears. But Miss Kalaski saw past all that and she fought for me, even though I gave her zero reason to. Her class was for the special kids, those who were the troublemakers in the school. She cared for the worst students, and they all ended up in her class. Uh, I remember one time after recess, I was completely stoned, bloodshot eyes and all, and she gave me this look like she knew what's up. Uh, she had this teacher's assistant named Yu Chung, and she would play with me and say things like, hey Yu Chung, you better explain that to Tim again. I don't think he quite got that. She was, uh, she was totally cool like that. Uh, she fought for me with the powers that be so I could do my grade 11 and grade 12 English in my grade 12 year. So I was able to uh, graduate on time. If it wasn't for her, I would have probably been expelled as I skipped classes like crazy and I almost failed pretty much every single class in grade 11. This is my actual high school uh, report card. Here's my F in grade 10 English, then my grade 11 grades. I failed chemistry 12 and I did it again in summer school. Here I was 56.31 days absent in grade 11 and we had like five classes a day so I apparently missed over 281 classes during that year. Based on my report card I should have ended up being a complete failure but I'm grateful 
I'm forever grateful to Mrs. Klasky for believing in me. I probably wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for her. She was one of the shining lights in my darkest years and uh, gave me hope. So in grade 12, I actually started getting a bit more serious about my life. Also, surprisingly, my buddy from the Drake House incident literally sm stopped smoking up and went cold turkey in grade 12 because he wanted to get an unconditional acceptance into UBC so he could chill for the uh, provincial exams. He was, he was smart and always got good grades no matter what. I don't know how he did it till this day, but uh, he was always known for that, so it influenced me. So then I reduced my ganja intake and actually studied the night before exams. I turned my grades around and got into UBC and graduated with a commerce degree specializing in real estate. Everything was looking good on the outside. However, the roots of my corruption and my insecurities ran deep into my soul. The pursuit of money, status, and self-fulfilling desires were all still there. I was proud and vain, so when I started making money, that just amplified who I was. One of the first things I bought as an agent was a $600 pair of Ferragamo shoes. It was the first time I ever bought a luxury product with my own money, so I felt like I was on top of the world. I was still obsessed with how I looked and what people thought of me, so I bought a BMW, wore Armani suits, and was careless with my money, regularly treating people to food and drinks. I would get drunk and be like, everything's on me, and pay for everything without even, think about, without even thinking about it. I was overcompensating for my insecurities and I thought by doing this, people would like me and respect me more. However, now that I look back and think about it, uh, it did the opposite. People probably didn't really like me and started taking advantage of me. I was a complete fool. All I thought about was having a good time. I thought I was living the best life, but after indulging myself, there was just complete emptiness in my soul. So. I would go look after the next pleasure to fill that gap. And that was my life on repeat, all the while plunging deeper and deeper and deeper into the abyss. I was, however, responsible enough to take my work seriously, so I put it before everything else. I was obsessed with working and making money because I thought it gave me clout. Money gave me this newfound freedom to do whatever my heart's desired. So I indulged myself in the finer things in life, like the greedy pig I was. It, made, it enabled me to do more evil to myself than good. I really didn't change my ways until I met my wife. She saw me for who I really was and was able to tame the monster and pull me back out of the abyss and guide me back into the light. I returned to church. I reconciled my sins with God. It has taken me years of healing, education, and self-reflection to get to where I'm currently at today. I still have a lot to work on, like my anger management, especially when I get behind the wheel of a car, but I no longer have the emptiness inside and have unshackled my desires from the things of this world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I have now lived half of my life on my way to becoming an old man. My youthful days are now behind me, and my time on this earth is running out. If I'm lucky, I'll probably get another 40 years or so, which if you actually reflect upon it, it's nothing. I've truly had a blessed and privileged life and got to experience all the best things the world has to offer. So what's the point in telling you a part of my life story? Well, I guess I'm hoping some of you can relate to my story and background. And for those of you who are regularly watching this channel, I wanted to share with you who I really am and give you an idea of where I actually came from. To be transparent and honest with you, even though it makes me look bad, Maybe there's something that you can learn from my experience so that you won't have to go through what I went through. Or if you're trapped by the same mind virus 
that was infecting me. Hopefully you can realize what has happened to you and start freeing yourself from it. Or if you're pursuing money and thinking it'll bring you happiness, I'm telling you straight up that it won't. Now that I know what is truly important in life, the material things really don't appeal to me anymore. Don't get me wrong though, I do like nice quality things. Who doesn't? But if I don't have it, I honestly don't care. I'm the worst person to buy a present for. I've experienced what it's like to be at the bottom and what it feels like to be at the top. I'm not anywhere close to the level of Drake rich, but I have absolutely no desire to do so. I've realized that in the grand scheme of life, everything is only an incremental difference in terms of quality, convenience, and pleasure. Let me prove it to you. Let's compare our life to Drake's life to see if there are really any fundamental differences. Let's start with this house. Like all of us, Drake is limited to be physically present in only one space at any moment in time. Ask anyone who has a big house, when was the last time you went into every single room? I'm pretty confident Drake probably spends most of his time in just a few rooms, primary, primarily in his bedroom where he sleeps. Does it matter if he sleeps on a million dollar bed or a $400 Ikea bed? Does it really make a difference in sleep quality? Do you think he's worry free because he's rich and lives in a huge house? As long as you're getting a good rest, isn't that what's really important? At any moment in time, Drake can only sleep on one bed, sit or stand in one room and sit on one toilet. It's probably a nicer quality, but does it really matter? As long as I get a good night's sleep, have a place to chill and do my business, I think I'm good. At the end of the day, your home is a place to provide you with shelter, privacy, and to protect you from the elements. Does it really matter how impressive your house really is? To whom? Drake probably eats three meals every day. I mostly eat three meals every day. I could eat exactly the same thing he does because food isn't that expensive in the grand scheme of things. Most of you could probably afford to eat 99% of the things he primarily eats at least once in your life as well. I don't think anyone on this planet would enjoy champagne and caviar for every single meal. What's the purpose of food? To give nutrients and energy to your body so we can live. I think most of you watching this video right now have enough to eat, maybe even too much for some of you. Plus, everyone likes different foods, so on the food front, I don't think there's much differences from Drake. At any moment in time, Drake can only drive or ride in one car at a time. The quality of the car is probably a lot better than mine, but what's the fundamental purpose of a car? To get me from point A to point B. So does it really matter about the quality of vehicle I use to get there? Or is the important thing just getting there safe and in one piece? The amount of time it takes probably is going to be almost the same. So what's really the difference? Does he physically or mentally benefit in any way at all by having a nice car? Or is it all just vanity and pride? I hope you're getting my point. Your life isn't much different than Drake's. He probably has a few hours in his day on some days that are completely different from an experience point of view, but the primary biological core essentials are all the same. He's limited to his physical body and time, just like we all are, which means there is a limit to the physical indulgence and the change in levels is only incremental and that difference is completely fabricated in our own minds. This goes for pretty much everything in life. Vacations, clothes, all material things. In the grand scheme of things, it's just an incremental difference in quality, service, and quantity. 
it's really nothing at the end of the day. Yet people will cheat, deceive, steal, and even kill just so they can experience this incremental difference in their life that lasts only for that moment and then it's gone like a vapor in the wind. After deeply reflecting on why money and material things weren't making me happy, I've come to this conclusion that everything in life is pretty much the same. I realize that throughout human history, people have been striving for these things, material things, and history is just repeating itself. Really observe the world around you. You'll realize that we're all living a very similar life. After traveling around the world and observing how different people live, it's pretty much all the same, just with different materials, colors, and slightly different behaviors that we call culture. Everyone eats, sleeps, works, and plays. All the same, just different variations. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. So don't be deceived and believe the lies that you need this or that thing to make you happy. Set your hearts on a higher purpose. Don't settle for lowly material things. They will never satisfy you. If it did, rich people would be the happiest, most fulfilled people in the world. Yet many of them are the most miserable and broken, killers and evildoers, selfish and heartless, only fulfilling their own desires. As an individual human being, there is a limit to what I can consume and experience because of my physical body. The only difference between the poor guy and the rich guy is the quality and quantity of each consumable. If you're familiar with the Maslow hierarchy of needs pyramid, which is a well-known psychological theory that depicts a five tier model of what drives human motivation, you'll see that the material things are on, all on the bottom of the pyramid while self-actualization sits at the very top. Less than 2% of the population actually reaches the top where an individual has achieved one's potential. Why do so many of us crawl back to the bottom of the pyramid? Why do we give our valuable time and our lives for which has already been satisfied? We already have it, we all do. We live in the most prosperous generation ever why do we keep pursuing such insignificant material things to move up the perceived social ladder? Is this what life really is about? And is there any meaning and true fulfillments from accomplishing this? Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Pursue a higher purpose. Focus on what is more important by looking up, not down. I'm not saying that money isn't important, and it definitely is necessary for life. But what's more important is where your heart is. So where is your heart? Is it on the treasures of this world? Are you pursuing the right thing? Have you been tricked into going after the wrong thing? Are you experiencing the same mind virus as I contracted in my grade seven year? What have you realized about yourself now that you know these things? Are you corrupted beyond repair that even though you hear all this, you just think I'm full of crap? What can you do to change your life so your priorities are now in line with what's really important in your life? Listen to what King Solomon, the wisest man in history of mankind, 
wrote at the end of his life. This was someone who literally accomplished everything and had it all and was probably the richest person ever to live on the face of the earth. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands have done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Wow. There is meaning to your life and you can find it if you search for the truth. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For anyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. I hope everyone watching this reaches their full potential during their lifetime. By searching for truth and reprioritizing on what motivates them in their life, you may not know this, but your life has incredible value. Your life is actually a miracle. So it will be a shame for you to waste it chasing after the wind. Peace be with you. 안녕히 계세요. I'll see you in the next video.